When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Kitties, this is a very special episode, so I'm going to try and make this short. Tonight's episode of Twisted Tea Time is brought to you in part by you, the listeners. If you want to help this show, well, share us or go on to iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you get your podcast goodies and give us a positive review. That'll help us grow and help us get the word out to others who are looking for prime quality horror narration. If you want to contribute in a more financial nature, then go to www.patreon.com forward slash the mad catter and sign up for one of our monthly subscriptions. It goes a long way to keeping this show going as it's largely paid for out of pockets. And these pockets aren't exactly overflowing with the green backs. Now, that said, without further ado, on with the show! Oh, fuck. Shit. Fuck. Oh, God. What the fuck is following me? Oh, thank God. Uh, ah! Ah! What in the 15 hells? Goddamn kids don't even know how to knock. You, you made me spill my drink. Huh? What? Sorry, I was being chased by a fucking monster. Monster? Let me see. <laughs> That's just a rumple puss. They're quite harmless, so long as you can outrun them. It didn't scratch you with its claws, did it? What? Um, no. Thank God, no. Ah! Excellent! Their claws are coated in a rather intense poison. Takes a bit to kick in. And it doesn't quite kill you, but the pain is absolutely excruciating from what I hear. One moment. shouldn't bother the cabin for a while, and it might linger in the area for a bit, but I'm pretty sure I scared it off. Still, you may want to take a load off and make yourself at home for the time being. Oh. Thank you, mate. So, what brings a backpacker from down under to this wretched, beast-filled valley? I'm... I'm on vacation. Vacation? <laughs> Do you like fruit? Because I think it's safe to say your vacation went a little pear-shaped. Especially if you wound up in my valley. Your valley? You told that thing off somehow. Are you able to control them or something? Or something. Let's just say they leave me be. I'm scarier than they are. You are? Indeed. But don't you worry, I'm on vacation too. Now, I need a little more tea, since I seem to have spilled mine. That's rum, not tea. I can smell it from here. Rum, tea, it's all the same to me. Mate, that makes absolutely no sense. I often don't. Now, you look parched. Want a drink? I have a fully stocked bar, and you might as well make yourself comfortable. Yeah, sure. 
Uh, that'd be great. I could use a drink after the day I've had. Excellent! What's your poison? Jaeger bombs, maybe? How about a Carlton Dry, or even a VB? Hell, anything at this point. There is something out there trying to eat me. So being in here and drinking some alcohol sounds like a fantastic idea. Huh. Alright. I like the way you think. I'll make you a Jaeger bomb, considering I, I detest Jaeger, and I need to deplete my stock. go. Thanks, mate. Cheers. God, that hits the spot. So, what are you doing living way out here? And what's up with your eyes? Well, as far as living way out here goes, I rather like this valley. It's special. A nice little retreat between dalliances among you humans. I mean... Sure, it takes a little getting used to all of the monsters and whatnot, but it can be quite cozy. Wait, did you say humans? Well, yeah. Do humans typically have cat's eyes? I suppose not. So, if you're not human, what are you then? A catter, which is like a feline, but fond of hats. And cat in the hat was already taken. I see. Indeed. Now, you. What do you do? That's one of the usual conversation topics people employ, right? Yeah, do you mean for a living or for fun? Yes! Ah, well, I'm a surgeon with a speciality in fingertip shaping. I know it sounds weird, but really it's what I do. Every day I rock up to work, look at ladies' fingers, not the savoury sweet, and consult them on how to best shape their fingers. I get paid so much you wouldn't believe. Somewhere in the ballpark of 500k to 700k a year. It's absolutely insane. And let me just say, it's a fantastic conversation starter. You walk into a bar, you order a beer, and then all of a sudden, this lady starts looking at me. And the first thing I say is, wow, your fingertips are amazing. And just like that, conversation started. Amidst our running and hiking and going to the gym, uh, that's pretty much it for me. I mean, I do tell stories online sometimes, but... <laughs> stories, you say? What sort of stories? Um, the podcast is called uh, Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales. Oh, how positively perfect! I actually listened to your podcast. Oh, by the way, how's the poison treating you? What? Oh, um, good. Very good. What? No! Not the drink. I mean the poison. You should be feeling a little rumbly in the tumbly right about now. What? What the hell are you talking about? Well, I put poison in your drink. I mean, I asked you what your poison was, and, and you said Jaeger bomb, and I just assumed you wanted it to be in the Jaeger bomb, so I picked a tasteless, slow-acting poison that I'm particularly fond of and slipped it into your drink. What? What the fuck? I thought you said I was safe. No! Oh, <laughs> you are, after a fashion. What does that even mean? Oh god, I can feel it. Am I going to die? Eventually. Why would you even do something like that? Because you made me spill my drink. Your drink? What? Are you insane? Insane? No. Mad? Very. Oh, fuck. I just can't believe my day. The hell did I do to deserve such goddamn luck? I had nothing to do with your luck since I'm on vacation, but you are in luck, as I have the antidote. Why would you poison me and then offer me an antidote? What do you want? Well, it's simple, really. Originally, I wasn't planning on doing so, but I rather like stories, and you're a storyteller. So here's how it's going to go. You'll tell me a story... And you'll make it a good one. Then, maybe I'll tell you a story, because I like that sort of thing. And then you'll tell me another.
another story. And then maybe I'll tell another or not. We'll have to see how much time we have. If I like your stories, though, you not only get the antidote, but I'll also guarantee you safe passage out of my valley and back to the trailhead that you left. How does that sound? You needed to poison me to get me to tell you stories. No. I poisoned you because you made me spill my drink. I gave you the offer because I like stories. Okay, okay, okay. Look, why not just give me the antidote, okay? And then I can tell you all the stories you want. (laughs) Where's the fun in that? You see, this way I know you'll tell them like your life depends on it. (laughs) Because it does. You are off your fucking rocker, mate. Perhaps. So what do you say? Deal? Time's a ticking. Hmm. Okay, fine. You crazy bastard. I'll play your game. You want a story? I'll give you a story. Oh, goody! <laughs> Okay, um, let me think. Ah, perfect. This is a story called The Monster Under My Bed Saved My Life for the Past 20 Years by Lord Lackland. Well, that's one hell of a mouthful. Though I must say, the author's name is quite delightful. Isn't it? Now, would you let me tell the story? My stomach is feeling restless. Go on... The monster under my bed has saved my life every night for the past 20 years. Until I was 17, a chance encounter with a dog could paralyze me in fear. Although it was one of those irrational phobias that harmed me more than it kept me safe. It held a foundation in reason, or so I told myself. When I was about six, I was chased up a tree by an immense black wolf. It never bit or scratched me, but ever since... I've relived the event continually. Every evening when I close my eyes, I can see him, his red eyes, as my childlike imagination constructed, boring into my soul before I turn around and flee. As if these dreams and their coinciding insomnia weren't enough for young me, fate also decided to rent out the space below my bed to a monster, one that's followed me from bed to bed for the past 20 years. It's not unusual for children to imagine monsters under their beds. Perhaps it's a way of rationalizing all the world's evils which their minds aren't yet equipped to understand. My monster just happened to be accompanied by the unmistakable scent of burnt sulfur. But I never really thought that the scratching and odor under my bed were anything other than the house settling. At least not until I received the first chink in my armor of logic and reason. One night when I was 16, we had a break-in, and by we, I mean I because both my parents were on vacation and my sister had left to get high with her boyfriend. I was pouring myself some melatonin from my bedside table when the burglar entered the house. I first heard him rummaging around the living room, then I made out the desolate creaking of stairs. When the man's shadow swept beneath my door, I scurried out of my covers and under my bed. That's when I saw the dog. He lay facing me in a sphinx-like prone, his white fur immaculately clean despite the decade of dust and grime that had built upon my floor. Oddly, he had hooves and small horns like a goat, but there was no denying that he was a dog otherwise. What solidified my terror-induced freeze were his eyes, like the ones I'd seen in the woods. They were a lurid scarlet, but unlike that beast, these were not rage-filled eyes. They were wide, giving him an almost surprised expression. When the door opened, he snapped his head in its direction, and a large hoof slammed against my face in time to suppress a scream. That was when I fainted, though I'm proud to have held out for 30 seconds or so. When I woke up, I was back in bed, the sheets tucked in sloppily around me. I slowly lowered my head past my bed frame, but there was nothing there. Not even the dust. The dust. My heart sank as I noticed a large disturbance in the usual grime dotted with hoof prints. 
that would have been left by a large hound. I think I fainted again because I woke up on the floor with a massive headache around 11am. This time, the dust had resurfaced. I inspected the house only to find that nothing had been stolen or misplaced. In fact, the living room was cleaner than it normally was. Night arrived, and I heard the usual orchestra of scratching and creaking amidst the concentrated scent of urine before I could fully drift off. I lowered myself to the floor, feet first this time, so I couldn't hurt my head, and, to my worst fears, saw two red eyes staring back at me. I know that dogs can't smile or laugh or anything, but I could have sworn that this monster had been. Then again, I also know that dogs can't talk, yet he started to anyways. Hello, Edward, he said cheerfully. Please don't faint again. I promise I don't enjoy biting. Talking dogs? Fuck that. I thought as my vision started to fade for a third time. He ran behind me and caught my head like a pillow, causing me to jump up before I could fully escape reality. Why the fuck are you living under my bed? What are you? I managed to stammer out after a stream of expletives. Well, he said, I'm a dog with goat hooves and horns. He gently lowered and shook his head. I have a name, but you wouldn't know it. It's not important. My job is to guide and protect travelers, so I assure you that I'm only here to help. Yeah, I can see them, but why are you under my bed? I had reached a point where everything around me seemed so surreal that I had begun to accept it as normal. I suppose it's a defense mechanism, maybe rationalization, but I felt entirely helpless anyways. Well... You've been plagued with nightmares recently. Most people define journeys as going from point A to point B. But are not dreams included in this definition? Your body may not travel, but your mind certainly does, and you are no less prone to harm while sleeping. He had lost me at this point, where a dog started to talk, but I nodded along anyways. What do you have to do with my dreams? I inquired. You spend so much time running to that little tree that you never look back to see why the black dog hasn't caught up. After all, the tree is a fair distance away, and he certainly has the speed to make it before you. I began racking my mind for an answer, but the dream was too frightening to relive. Here, I'll help you out. Try to picture his tail when you were up in the tree. Suddenly, the dog's grotesque figure leaped into my mind, this time from a bird's eye view. It's all bloodied and cut up, I said, forcing my eyes open. Ding, ding, ding. That's usually what happens when one beast grabs another by the tail. I swear he smiled again. Does that mean... It does. I was there in the woods as well. For you were technically a traveller, even if you were just wandering off from your picnic site. After all, there are many types of travels. A journey of even three feet can be made in an adventure by the young, imaginative mind. If I remember correctly, you were pretending to be a pirate trying to rescue a maiden when you suddenly stumbled upon my friend Blackbeard instead. Think of me like the English Lieutenant Colonel, Alexander Sportswood. My job is to stop and kill Blackbeard, wherever he may try to wreak havoc, and I have gotten very good at it. Okay, well, good night, I said, slurring the words together. I know that in movies and stuff, we would have had this mind-opening conversation that leads to some big epiphany on my part. But these writers have never experienced what I faced. Not only is your entire mind overwhelmed, it fixates itself on a single aspect of what's happening to try to reduce its burden. I was fixated on the fact that a dog was talking, and everything else went out of my head, or at least under my conscious. Our rational brain simply hasn't developed to process impossibility. That's the job of the imagination, and the amount of schemas that I need to accommodate to rationalize this tangible beast would have driven me mad. I guess I could have disassociated, and I did for a bit, but the easiest thing to do was to sleep. Sleep and pretend like nothing out of the ordinary had happened. That night, in my nightmare, the black dog was wearing a pirate's hat and an eye patch. I laughed, and when I woke up, I found a small, felted naval officer between my arm and body. It was the only comforting gesture capable of breaking my stubborn shell of logic and reason, if only for a moment. Since that night, I have left my monster more or less alone. I'm still afraid of dogs, but much less so than I once was. Now my fear is limited to large, black dogs who have hooves and smell like piss. It's a fairly minute demographic. On holidays, 
and my worst nights, he usually leaves a small present on my bed, I suppose as a friendship gesture. I must say that his felting skills have improved tremendously, and he's even begun to pick up crochet. From time to time, however, I feel the black dog still watching me. On deserted roads, when a yellow darkness enroaches my every sense, I can see his red eyes stalking from deserted alleyways. When I'm alone in my apartment, longing for my family, I hear the rattling of his chains behind me, and I know that he's preparing to strike, sealing the kill once and for all. During these nights, no rational thought is able to pierce the screen of evil that engulfs me, blurring the lines of the world until only fetid darkness remains. Whenever I'm at my most vulnerable, and I know that the black dog has gained my scent once more, I spend a night talking to the monster under my bed. He always quells my fear, providing a friend in an abandoned world. For me, he's become an escape from reality, a paradoxical collision between the two worlds of childish imagination and empirical logic. I've been living with him for a decade since we first interacted, and my life has generally improved. After a small discussion, my bedroom, now an apartment, has even gone from smelling like burnt sulfur to smelling like urine with a hint of wet dog and Hearts Infusions dog shampoo. Perhaps it would be beneficial if more people opened the floodgates to the world of impossibilities every now and then. After all, indulging the ghosts of our reality can only blind us to a more universal, if occulted, presence in life. Kindness. Wow! That was a good story. A little tame, though. Sounds like a number of dream guardians I know. Just like them to leave a place smelling of dog and piss. It's a small price to pay to avoid getting ripped to shred by a pirate dog beast. Fair point. Fair point. Uh, well, I think I know what tale I'll tell. This is a special one. You could say it involves a family of mine, after a fashion. Wait, there's more like you? Holy shit, you have to be kidding me. Oh, sure. I'm not the only boogeyman out there, and even then, I have a very particularly focused purpose when I'm working. What? Boogeyman? Yes. Don't worry, though. I'm on vacation. Right. Well, that's a load off my poisoned stomach. Hey, you know what's better than a vacation? The cure to a debilitating poison. Yeah. Isn't it? Now, this boogeyman... Well... They're a guardian of sorts. Much like your horned, hoofed dog thing. But theirs... Theirs is not so happy a tale. I give you The Whisperer of Nightmares by Z.P. Gowdy. Once upon a time, not so very long ago, there lived a carpenter and his daughter. While their names are unimportant to this story, their actions that led them to their fate most certainly are. The carpenter was a skilled man, having worked with his hands since he was a lad, and a hard worker as well, leaving every morning at dawn, then toiling all day long, only to return just a couple hours before dusk. The girl, his daughter, was an independent spirit by necessity. She would attend to her schooling every day, return home, and attend to her chores every afternoon. Then, depending on the day of the week, either she or her father would prepare supper for the evening. Every night, the carpenter would then ascend the stairs to his daughter's bedroom and tell her a story. Everything from fairy tales, to stories of adventure, to myths of old. She lived for those stories, and she loved them dearly. Life this way wasn't overly easy, nor was it particularly hard. 
and the relationship between father and daughter was as strong and loving as it could be. There was, however, a secret, which can be a dangerous thing, for secrets can unravel the strongest of bonds, either through their revelation or the simple act of keeping them. The carpenter's secret seemed simple enough, and since the girl knew of it, she was content that he keep it. For, you see, the basement was locked at all times, and he forbade her from ever descending into its depths, especially on those nights when the moon was fat and full, when he returned home late and descended down into the darkness to work on his project. On those nights, his hammers pounded, and his saws screamed. And the girl could have sworn that she heard strange whispers. The girl did not like those evenings. She did not like them at all. On those nights when the carpenter ascended from the basement, looking haggard and worn, the bedtime stories were dark and filled with fearsome monsters and heroes who might succeed in their goals, but never did so without paying a dear price. Whenever her father told these stories, he always finished with, Remember, girl. When the shadows are thick and there are nightmares around, make not a whisper, make not a sound. The girl did not like those stories. She did not like them at all. Then, one fateful evening, when the moon hung fat and full in the night sky, rejecting the light and sending it back to the earth, the pounding of the hammer, the screams of the saw, cut off, followed by running footsteps somewhere in the house and the slamming of the front door. In the fearful silence that followed, the girl wondered if she had heard a scream as the sounds of working stopped, and thought she would ask her father about it when he came up to tell her those dark and dreary bedtime stories. But her father did not come upstairs. She listened to the clock tick out a beat for the minutes to march to, and kept waiting for her father to do what he had done every night for as long as her young mind could remember. But her father did not come upstairs. She crept out of bed and made her way downstairs towards the kitchen where the entrance to the basement stood, unlocked and open. Something it had never been before. There was a trail of something wet and dark leading from the basement to the front door, something she had never seen before. There was a strange, hoarse, rasping sound coming from the darkness below, something she had never heard before. She called out for her father. The rasping sound stopped and something moved in the darkness. But her father did not come upstairs. She tried turning on the lights. The bulb flickered, then popped. In that brief flash of illumination, the girl thought she saw her father at the base of the stairs. He had looked hurt. And while she longed to run and help him, she was not foolish. So she first got a flashlight from the kitchen and shone it down ahead of her. There her father was, crumpled against the wall at the base of the stairs. And he looked 
terrible. But at least he appeared to still be breathing. Quickly, the girl raced down the stairs to her father's side. He stirred, and when he saw her frightened face, she saw fear cast upon his as well. He looked around carefully, worriedly, and tried to stand but couldn't, so great were his wounds. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I tried to keep it closed, he said in a strained voice. The girl's eyes followed her father's gaze, and she let out a gasp. There, in the opposite wall, was a strange archway of black marble. Peculiar writing was carved into its surface, and those runes pulsed and glowed with a sickly green light. Before the structure stood a ghastly table that bore leather straps and sinister stains. The girl did not like that arch and table. She did not like them at all. I did it for you, daughter. To keep you safe. The carpenter said, clearly growing weaker. He was clutching something sticking out of his side, and the floor was wet and sticky around him. I had to keep it closed. To keep them sealed away. But I couldn't complete the ritual. And the sacrifice escaped. The girl watched as that pulsing green light flared brightly and then died. Remember what I told you, girl. When the shadows are thick and there are nightmares around, make not a whisper, make not a sound. Darkness began to fill the center of the archway, spreading across its surface like spilled ink, and the shadows around them seemed to stretch and grow, encroaching on the suddenly feeble beam from the flashlight. The air was filled with strange cries as hands claws and tendrils seemed to stretch from that macabre gateway, reaching across the floor toward the huddled pair. The girl tried to help her father up, and he tried weakly to push her away. The carpenter struggled to stand facing the monstrous limbs. Take me Take me and leave this place. I will be your vessel. The girl heard whispers now, loud and clear among those cries. Such horrible whispers that told of such terrible things. The inky hands, claws, and tendrils seemed to grasp at her father, but they didn't pull at him. They seemed to plunge into him. No! Came the soft, fearful voice of the girl. She had made a whisper. She had made a sound. Faced with a young body, a healthy body, one not weakened by age or wounds, the nightmarish limbs recoiled from the carpenter, who fell to the ground, too weak to stop what was to come. They lunged for the girl, grabbing her with hands, claws, and tendrils. When she opened her mouth to scream, they filled it with their whispers. Her eyes turned black as the light was snuffed from them, replaced with the darkness of nightmare. Her skin turned pale as the warmth was flushed from it, replaced with the cold of fear. 
She fell to her knees, her body writhing and spasming as she struggled to contain thousands upon thousands of nightmares, all vying for control of their new vessel. With the last of his strength, the carpenter held his daughter down and drew strange markings onto her forehead. She thrashed and writhed, screeched and cried, and when the final marking was done, she lashed out at her father with such power that his head struck the wall, and he fell, never to rise again. Seeing what she had done, and filled with pain and fear and loss, the likes of which she had never felt before, the girl fled into the shadows. Now she is a vessel, a prison, made immortal by its very prisoners, sharing their many powers. But she was still young of mind, and her human body simply wasn't meant to contain its charges. So now she crawls from house to house upon a path of inky black shadows, slips from closet to closet, slithers from underneath bed to underneath bed. When it gets to be too much, she emerges from the darkness, finds a sleeping mortal, and whispers nightmares into their ears, relieving herself little by little of her troublesome prisoners. Sometimes these sleeping mortals waken, and with her magic she makes sure that they cannot move and cannot speak. She does not wish to share her burden, just lighten it, little by little. For when she comes, the shadows grow thick, and there are nightmares around. So it's best her victims make not a whisper, and make not a sound. <gasps> Thus ends the tale of the Whisperer of Nightmares. Pleasant dreams. That's horrible. That poor girl. Yep. Get curious one evening, and all of a sudden you find out Daddy's a serial killer slaughtering innocents in order to keep some sort of dark gate sealed, and then you make a little sound, and BAM! You're a living prison for a horde of nightmares. In fact, think of her as a, a tea kettle. It gets to boiling, and suddenly that shrill whistling sound fills the air. So you take it off the stove, or you pop the cap and let off some steam, and the sound goes away. Her feeding nightmares to mortals is basically that. Huh. I see. And she's never on vacation. Right. Well, my turn then, I guess. If you're wanting something a little less upbeat, I think I know the one. This one is called My Weeping Watchman by Spilling Skies. The first time I saw him was the Tuesday night, right before my seventh birthday. It was around 11pm and I was too excited to fall asleep. I was thinking about presents and cake and friends. I remember, I was drifting between asleep and awake when I felt my mattress creak and depress by my legs, as if someone had sat on it. I opened my eyes and found that someone had. He was tall, even as he sat a little hunched. His hands were covered in blood, and he was staring at them, with eyes buried in dark circles. And he was crying, silently, but still violently. I sat up in my bed, and he didn't seem to notice. I stared at him, crying for a long time. 
I don't know why I didn't scream and yell for my parents. There was a stranger in my room, on my bed after all. I was a stupidly brave and curious child, and watching him, I felt no fear. Eventually, I got tired of his tears. I reached forward and tugged on his sleeve. Are you okay, mister? He looked at me then, and I saw his eyes were brownish, greyish, and tired. He didn't say anything. Don't cry. I'm sorry you feel bad. Do you want a hug? I asked, because that was what my mum always asked me after I had been sobbing. He kept looking at me without a word, and I took that as a yes. I wrapped my small arms as far as they would go around his arms and chest, and rested my head against his upper arm. He smelled vaguely of laundry detergent and cold nights. I held him for as long as I could before my arms got tired, humming a lullaby like my mum would do to me. He was crying again, and I felt a tear fall onto my arm. It was warm and wet and trickled down off my arm, falling onto his shirt. Sleep came for me soon enough. As it took me into its blissful embrace, I vaguely felt my arm slip away from the weeping man that had been latched onto. It felt like a dream when I felt the arm I had been using as a pillow shift, and hands grab me under the arms, lifting me gently back to my actual pillow. I woke up, having forgotten the strange man. It was only when I sat at the breakfast table that my mother exclaimed at the blood stains on the underside of my short sleeves that I remembered. I saw her worried face, and babbled about the sad man with bloody hands from the previous night. Her worry turned to slight annoyance as my father laughed indulgently, asking me questions about my late night visitor. I had a history of imaginary friends, and my mother had hoped I had outgrown them. But she was puzzled about the bloodstains, while my father dismissed it as markers or paint. She and I both quickly forgot though, as the time for my birthday party rolled around. The birthday went by and I soon was waiting for the next one. The crying man came and sat on my bed every Tuesday night, and eventually I stopped telling my parents about him. They were getting very irritated and kind of concerned, but they didn't need to be. I knew the crying man meant no harm to me. As the months passed, I struck up a sort of comfortable companionship with him. I would talk to him about my week, I would tell him about my friends. But I never told my friends about him. They'd call me crazy. I'd tell him about my new games and what I'd seen riding my bike around town. Occasionally I'd tell him something cool I learned at school. He usually listened with interest, looking at me with exhausted eyes the colour of firewood. He nodded sometimes but he'd never say a word. And sometimes he'd ruffle my hair or pat my back, and the blood on his hands would come onto me, which I was sure to remove before my mother found out. I grew used to him being there, sitting at the end of my bed into the early hours of Wednesday. And he would always be sad. I mean, sure, every now and then the tears would stop, but his eyes would still be tortured and wet, and his breathing would be kind of hitched and weird, and then his eyes would overflow again, and we'd be back where we started, a crying man and a child trying to console him in whatever way. I tried telling him jokes, and funny stories. I leaned against him or patted his arm, I hugged him as much as a pair of small arms could, and told him it would be alright. I always got the feeling he never believed me. And then one day, he smiled at me, a weak, trembling smile, but a smile. I had been telling him about my baby sister who had dumped a bowl of cereal on her head that morning, and he was seemingly unbothered by it as my parents groaned and laughed. I remember I was laughing as I told him because to my child's brain that was the funniest thing ever. I could barely get the words out I was laughing so hard, but eventually I did and he smiled at me. The slight upturn of his lips shocked me so bad I stopped laughing. He didn't notice because he wasn't looking at me anymore. He was looking somewhere over my head, and I sat looking up at him, entranced. And then he chuckled to himself, a small, light sound. <laughs> it made me smile. He looked like he was remembering something, and I was quiet, not wanting to pull him from his reverie. I watched as he closed his eyes and chuckled again softly, <laughs> tears pushing their way out beneath his shot eyelids. He was sad again, 
even though he was smiling, and I reached out and took his hand in both of mine. He opened his eyes startled, and as they came to rest on me, I felt something in them I had not felt before. There were still the broken eyes of a broken man, but between the cracks there was now a fierce warmth. It made me feel safe, somehow untouchable. It was right around my twelfth birthday when he began to change. He didn't cry as hard anymore, or stare at the red on his hands, usually wide open in his lap. Sure, tears still fell down his cheeks, but his eyes were hard, staring at my window. He would clench and unclench his bloody fists, biting on his lower lip. I dismissed it, though I found it strange. A strange man was bound to do strange things. I still talked to him about all the normal things, but he didn't really seem to pay that much attention. He would just nod, absent-mindedly, when I tapped his shoulder. I didn't really mind. I was fine with him just being there. He was the only one who had never judged me. I could tell him anything. Then came the night I lost him. My secret friend. The night I realized he was more than that. My guardian. My defender. The night he spoke to me for the first and last time. I had been unusually quiet that night, feeling weird about this crush at school. I didn't really want to talk about it, and it must have seemed very unlike me because, for the first time in weeks, my friend looked away from the window and turned to me. I saw the stone in his gaze melt away until there was only his old soft sadness. It was this gentle look of his that prodded me to ask him what I had been wondering for years. Why? Is there blood on your hands? I whispered. He was silent, and his eyes were getting very watery. I tried again. Why don't you ever wash it off? He shook his head at me, and his gaze once again became stone as he turned back to the window. I sighed. <sighs> Pulling my covers closer and turning to face the wall. As I settled into sleep, I heard his voice. It was quiet and deep and sounded kind of achy like when your throat hurts from yelling a lot. All it said was, I don't want to forget. I looked at him over my shoulder. He was still and stoic, a statue staring at the window, glistening red fingers curling and uncurling. The tears made tracks down his cheeks, and I found myself falling asleep to his breathing, which was steady now. The shatter of glass woke me. There was a black-masked man kneeling in the shards. He had a glinting knife in his hand, I scrambled back against the wall. He headed towards me and then stopped to listen to my parents' footsteps running up the stairs. He was quicker than them though, than anyone I'd ever seen, and stronger too. He had my heavy dresser against the door before they could even reach it. I was terrified as he looked at me then, while my parents banged on the door trying to get it open. As he approached me, I realized it wasn't a mask. His face was just a dark void, with two burning silver pinpoints of light where his eyes should have been. My fear had left me mute and paralyzed, and now was successfully suffocating me. Then another figure stepped out of the shadows. As my eyes darted to the movement, the intruder's gaze followed. He didn't even have time to react, before my crying friend stabbed him in the stomach with some sort of dagger. The faceless guy tried to fight, but really, he never stood a chance. My friend had been waiting a long time to do this, and that night, his sadness had changed to anger that could not be contained. I watched as he stabbed once, twice, as many times as the number of tears he had cried. I didn't even know I was crying until I tasted the saltiness from the tears that had found their way between my lips. I could vaguely hear my mother screaming outside my bedroom and my father talking frantically on the phone while ramming his shoulder against the wood. My dresser was starting to shake with every push of his, and soon it would fall over. The crying man was done. He stood over the mutilated body, which was now emitting black smoke. He was breathing harshly, and for the first time ever, I was afraid of him. I began to sniffle, and he looked at me. He stared at me in surprise as I began to cry harder. He approached the bed slowly, and I was sobbing uncontrollably by the time he took me in his arms. My fear of him vanished then as I buried my head in his shoulders, the familiar smell of cold nights and flowery detergent comforting me. I knew him, 
He was my strange friend, my weekly visitor, my broken protector. I clutched him with my fingers, grabbing him tight, and he held me. As the dresser fell with a deafening crash and my father tried to force the door open, unsuccessfully. As my mother screamed my name from outside my shattered window, begging for me to be alright. As my neighbors roused, as the sirens drew closer and closer, he held me, sheltered me, soothed me against the panic happening everywhere outside my room. And I closed my eyes and fell asleep to his bloodstained hands rubbing my back and his usual tears in my hair. The rest was a blur to me, and I remember only bits. I found out the body that my sad man stabbed wasn't there when the cops got into my room, and neither was the sad man. There was just me, curled up in a little ball on top of my blankets, sound asleep. My shirt was bloodstained, and my hair was wet. There was glass on the floor, and the jars of seashells I had kept in my dresser had cracked. My parents were crying as they hugged me, but it wasn't the same. We went to a lot of places with buzzing fluorescent lights, and with uniforms who asked questions I didn't want to answer. But I answered them as best I could, leaving out my sad man, saying I just blacked out before the dark man got to my bed and remembered nothing until they had gotten to me. I didn't care about it. Any of it. My mind was on Tuesday, wanting to see him. But Tuesday came and went without him. And so did every other Tuesday since then. It's been years since he saved my life, and possibly my soul. It's been years since I last saw him, and God, if I could just see him one more time. But I know I won't. He did his duty to me, and perhaps to countless children before me. He saved us, and redeemed himself in everything but his own eyes. His own tired eyes. I'll never know why. Nor will I ever find out the reason for his eternal sadness. For the blood on his hands. For the Tuesday night specifically. Though... I have my guesses. Oh, my gentle guardian. My weeping watchman. My old friend. Thank you. I won't ever forget. How positively perfect. Now you have been an excellent guest. And I rather enjoyed your stories. So here, one last one. Hope that the stomach rumblies aren't getting too uncomfortable. Oh, I'm glad you like the stories. I'm just sitting here, you know, poisoned. Just hurry up. Excellent! Ahem. Once upon a time, there was a visitor to a far-off land. Though I suppose distance is a matter of perspective. But to the visitor, the land was far, far away. This visitor loved nature and decided to explore the hills and valleys this land had to offer. He got all his hiking gear together and set off. But somewhere along the way, he got lost and soon found himself in a very dangerous place indeed, which by itself wasn't too bad, at least not until he got chased by the dreaded and venomous... Or, or is it poisonous? Rumplepuss! He did what any smart human does when they get the attention of a rumplepuss and ran. As everyone knows, the best way to counter their deadly teeth and poisonous talons is to simply outrun them. But he was a mere human and knew his endurance wouldn't last until he found a cabin and inside a generous host, as well as handsome and smart and intelligent in every way. <clears throat> Said host granted him sanctuary and offered him a drink in exchange for stories. Mate, you are off your rocker. You really mean you poisoned me and held me for ransom in exchange for stories. Did I? Hmm. Well... Details, details. Anyway, the guest proved himself an excellent storyteller, and the generous host was oh so grateful, and in his vast generosity, granted the guest safe passage out of his valley. The end. The end? Wait, what about the antidote? What about it? Mate, you said you'd give me the antidote if my stories pleased you. 
Do I get it or not? Well, I suppose you could, but you don't really need it. What do you mean, I don't need it? My stomach feels like it's about to explode. Oh, that? That's just a mild poison. It makes you a bit gassy. Here, just burp and you'll be fine. What? That's it? <sighs> you said I would die from the poison. What the hell, mate? <laughs> no. I said you'd die eventually. Like all mortals. How you choose to interpret my words is utterly your own fault. Why? Why the hell would you even do something like that? You're a bloody nutter. Because... You made me spill my drink. Are you fucking serious? <sighs> Am I free to go? And will I be safe? One moment. <coughs> Perfectly. Just follow the trail that wasn't there before, and you'll be fine. You're sure this isn't another trick or anything? You see, I like storytellers, and I'd rather there be more in the world, not less. And you're one of the better ones I've come across. Mate, how do I know you're not fucking with me? Well, I suppose you don't, really. But... I did tell them that I'd be very upset if any harm came to you. I mean, you went through all of this over a spilled drink. Imagine what would happen if I was actually upset with something. So, I can go? Of course! With my full protection. Okay, well, um, goodbye, I guess. Goodbye! And thanks for all the stories. Yeah, okay. See you again soon. <laughs> <laughs>this week's podcast shout out goes to once again stories fables ghostly tales who in case you never gathered was tonight's co-star that's right the backpacker from down under is none other than the host of stories fables ghostly tales himself if you want to find more of his material you can look him up on soundcloud itunes stitcher radio and facebook just look up stories fables ghostly tales and if you want to find him on Twitter, you can find him at Stories Fables GT. I personally recommend the SCP Foundation stories, as he has a rather interesting take on them. Uh, so take it from me, his stuff is keen. Anyhow, thank you, SFGT, for working with me. That that was not an intentional rhyme. All right, roll the credits. The Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2017 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or their simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Jason White at SoundCloud.com slash Angels dash of dash despair. And Mew at SoundCloud.com slash M-Y-U-U. Details can be found in the show notes. If you want to support this show, please go to www. 
patreon.com slash the mad catter. For more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com slash Cheshire Hats or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. You can also download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hats. Well then, good night, kitties, and sweet dreams.